please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Rick Meyerowitz. Three, three more days. <laughs> three more days until our endless nightmare of an electoral, <laughs> an electoral process is over. Three more days until we stop having nightmares, until we stop waking up in the middle of the night with our stomach tied in knots. Three more days. We have two candidates, one flawed, smart, resilient, with great stamina. <laughs> the other, I don't know if I should say this, an ignorant, megalomaniacal lout from Queens. <laughs> Queens? We have choices. This election is almost impossible to satirize. As a person who did a lot of satire, where do you begin? How do you handle this? I, I know people, artists, who have started to draw Donald Trump and just stopped and said, it's no use, he's already done. Well, how can you do a drawing of him that's any worse, that criticizes him any more than just looking at the way he looks like? Anyway. You know, I, I have to tell you, I don't know if I have anything to tell you. But I think that if the National Lampoon was still here, it would be a fabulous thing. And if we... If we go back a little, here's where we should have like a, a kind of fade out uh, sort of thing, and we flash back, and I get all blurry, and suddenly I begin talking, and I'm 40 years younger, and I have hair. <laughs> uh, the National Lampoon began in 1969 when three guys from Harvard came to New York and decided that they were going to start a national humor magazine. They'd been on the Harvard Lampoon. And they gathered unto them all kinds of other people who were writers and artists who had amazing talent. Maybe they were only slightly less brilliant than these guys from Harvard. And all the people they brought to them wanted to change the world or blow it up or both. <laughs> and somehow, six months later, the first issue of the National Lampoon was published in April 1970. And it was a mishmash. But it took a little while, but we got our act together. And after a few months, the lampoon caught fire and took off like a rocket. We climbed through the drug-addled, countercultural haze uh, through the early, uh, through the late Vietnam years to hover over a nation that was sorely in need of a laugh. And the Lampoon's humor affected everybody. Raving right-wing lunatics, you know who you are. Uh, <laughs> Tie-dyed peaceniks, tedious nudniks, you also know who you are. All of these were affected by the Lampoon's stick-in-the-eyes sense of humor. And this irreverence seemed to work. The Lampoon was successful for a decade and important for a decade and somewhat less after that. It spun off all kinds of special projects. It spun off uh, uh, shows, television shows, theater shows, radio, records, books, and movies. And finally, the writers and artists themselves who left for greener pastures in Hollywood or uh, writing, uh, writing television, writing movies. Uh, I was part of that for 21 years. I haven't shown you any pictures yet, have I? <laughs> Maybe I should. I was part of the Lampoon for 21 years, and it was an incredible home for an artist, for a satirist. The Lampoon humor is sorely missed right now. I just read today in the New York Times that the Onion, the editors of The Onion, 
are having trouble coming up with ideas. They're banging their heads against the wall in their offices because they can't think of anything that they could satirize, goes back to my earlier point. So I'm going to show you a couple of images from the National Lampoon. This is good. This is... I can't tell you what they did with the dog. It's possible not enough people bought the issue. I don't know. The Lampoon had amazing visuals. Here's another one. This is one of mine. This is the Mona Gorilla. Not the Monkey Lisa. Anyone who calls it the Monkey Lisa will have to talk to me afterwards. I'm not happy about that. The Mona Gorilla. And she was done for a cover of the National Lampoon. It looked like this. She went on to become... She went on like she's a person. Uh, she w went on to become the mascot of the Lampoon and really the face of the Lampoon. They used it on everything. Posters, T-shirts, record albums, calendars. Um, I'm still waiting for the royalties. <laughs> So anyway, Mona was called one of the enduring icons of American humor. I don't know about that, but we'll go on. Here's, for those on, uh, with left sympathies, here's uh, the famous portrait of uh, Che Guevara, Guevara getting a pie in the face. This is the sports issue. really relevant now, isn't it? The, this poor woman modeled for this thing. She had to put up with that. But they told me that she was in good spirits throughout, even though she doesn't look like it. It's kind of relevant today. They did magazines within the magazine. You see the baby? You see the... There's a wonderful subhead over there, shoplifting for the hell of it. <laughs> they would publish the magazine, it might be eight or ten pages, it would be within the magazine. They did wonderful cartoons. <laughs> this is by the same artist for the depression issue, Sam Brooks. Everybody knows who this is. This was an issue called Escape, and inside they had a story about a man who found peace on an island in the middle of the Pacific uh, long after World War II. And this was the inner spread. <laughs> I know this as Hitler on the beach. And you don't see something like this every day, so it's worth looking at it. This is a cartoon by Charles Rodriguez and the Caption the cartoon is simply, uh, son of a bitch, we four Jews get together to make a plot to rule the world, and we wind up with an orthodox plot, a reform plot, a conservative <laughs> plot, and a Lubavitcher plot. And this, this was a wordless piece and actually doesn't need words. The point of all this is that nothing that was done for the National Lampoon could be done now. There is no place that would print any of these things, <laughs> with the exception maybe of my gorilla. There is just no place for this kind of humor. It's dangerous. It's in politically incorrect. <laughs> well, you know, they had an ad that said it floats. <laughs> All right. So I did this. I'm sorry. I, but anyway, you know, the thing about this is he's not trying to threaten the Pakistani prime minister. He's trying to sell him that missile. That was the point of the piece. I know. Newt Gingrich as Il Duce. And I just added my own touch to it. And notice his hair is a helmet. I really love that. Um, I tried to 
I tried to show the corruption of the man in the flesh. A lot of flesh there. <laughs> and really, he's very prominent today, so I, we see the same thing in his interview last week with Megyn Kelly. It was an extraordinary moment of what that word says. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> Somebody's insulted? <laughs> you know, John Cleese said, John Cleese of Monty Python, said that all humor is critical. Even an inclusive joke such as, how would you make God laugh? The answer, tell him your plans. <laughs> What's funny about that joke is, we all have plans. And we know we can't keep them, but we make them anyway. The joke is critical, inclusive, and without criticism, without offending someone, you can't have satire. And if you can't have satire, then humor begins to fade. And if humor fades, then our sense of proportion goes with it. And if that goes, that John Cleese says that as far as he's concerned, we're all living in 1984. I did this drawing. I'm kind of sorry I did, and I kind of love that I did it at the same time. And there's the thing about doing this. You have to sometimes go against what you politically feel because you want to make a comment. Okay, I loved it. <laughs> now everybody knows this guy, or maybe you don't know this guy, the Ayatollah. I had to draw the Ayatollah for an article I, I was writing, and I thought, what can I do about the Ayatollah? to make him different. Well, I looked around, I couldn't find a photo of him smiling. Never once did he have a smile on his face or did he seem to be enjoying himself. And so, I drew him like this. <laughs> I thought it was the worst thing I could do, was show him opening his mouth and laughing. And I gave him the worst set of teeth in the Mideast. Because <laughs> I thought, I want to give this guy a toothache, if I can. I did this a few years ago for the Los Angeles Public Library. It's Salman Rushdie. I'm going to put on my glasses here. Um, I want to read to you the fatwa that the Ayatollah put on Salman Rushdie. I assume you know that there was a fatwa put on him, but you may not know what it said. I am informing all brave Muslims of the world that the author of the Satanic Verses, a text written, edited, and published against Islam, the Prophet of Islam and the Quran, along with all the editors and publishers and anyone else aware of its contents, are condemned to death. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay, so that no one will ever dare insult the sacred beliefs of Muslims henceforth. And whoever is killed in this cause will be a martyr, Allah willing. Well. That's enough of that. Um, but, you know, this is an ongoing issue. This is a wonderful painting by Magritte, and the title of this painting is The Treachery of Images, because, of course, it's not a pipe. It's a painting, and that's what he was meaning by that. And someone parodied it online, and I saw this, and I left. Not a pipe. Oh, peep, it's not a peep, and it's not Muhammad. Well, it could be Muhammad, we don't know, but that says it's not. What would happen if we drew Muhammad? This is from one of my sketchbooks. I was at the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, and there they have a little gold and crystal case with three little truffles in it, chocolate truffles maybe, with, and each one has a couple of hairs coming out of it. And it says that the hairs are the prophet. Well, I made a drawing of this. By the way, they were selling postcards of it, a photo of it. I made a drawing of this. And then I thought, uh-oh, if anybody sees it, would someone kill me for having done this, for having drawn the hairs? I mean, they're on display. And what the Ayatollah said is anyone who is responsible for this, anyone who sees it, um, can also be killed. And I just want to point out to you that you've all seen this right now. <laughs> So, too bad if you looked. <laughs> this, is, this is my painting of the presentation of the bill 
for the Last Supper. <laughs> I don't call it the Last Supper because that would be redundant. It's the presentation of the bill. And the most important thing for me in this picture is Jesus' expression. When he's holding the bill in his hand, you know, 56 Bloody Marys, uh, 25 pink ladies, fatted calf, withered figs, the bill said all those things. He's holding that, and his expression had to say, Jesus F. Christ, when he looked at it. <laughs> if I caught that, then this was successful. Would all good Christians and valiant Christians want to kill me for having done this? Hasn't happened yet. Here's Martin Luther nailing his 95 feces to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg. Are Lutherans in Minnesota grabbing pitchforks from their barns and coming after me? I don't think so. Not yet. It hasn't happened. These are the birds of Israel, the drawing that I did. They all have big beaks. I thought it was funny. And I sell these prints. I'm not selling you prints. I sell these prints, and my biggest customers are other Jews. And they seem to like it. Nobody's coming after me with, you know, a, like a Torah scroll to hammer me into the ground. <laughs> Here's God. I thought, well, you know, the, I, 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 I'm not in trouble for all these other things. Maybe if I just draw God, somebody will come after me. Hasn't happened yet. By the way, I love his coat. <laughs> anyway, he looks pissed off. And that's kind of how I saw him. So here's Montaigne. We all know Montaigne, right? We know who he is. That's what he looked like, I think. I have a quote from Montaigne. Montaigne, you know, lived in perilous times in the late 1500s. And he wrote, what is it that makes all our quarrels end in death nowadays? Whereas our fathers knew degrees of vengeance, we now begin at the end and straight away talk of nothing but killing. What causes that if not cowardice? To which I would add, what is it with all this fear in the land? That's abroad today, fear of the other, fear of change. We had a president who once talked about not being afraid of fear. And I just want to point out that didn't we used to be the home of the brave? What is all this about? Well. This is a drawing of uh, Donald by our greatest caricaturist, American caricaturist of the 20th century, David Levine. And he got it right. This is done in the 1980s. This is 30 years ago. And he got it absolutely right. I mean, that diaper. <laughs> Pretty great. All right. Two weeks ago, my friend Myra Kalman and I were asked to do come up with an idea for a New Yorker cover at the, for the end of the election. And we had this idea, and this is a sketch that we sent in, that it would be just a big pussy on the front of the New Yorker <laughs> with Trump's tie coming out of its mouth <laughs> and little bits of its coat, his jacket, and orange hair. The Lampoon would have printed that, <laughs> but they didn't go for it. <laughs> this is my friend George Walensky. I used to hang out with him when I went to Paris a lot, man, back in the 70s and early 80s. He was a great cartoonist. We would have lunches, so like six cartoonists and illustrators, we'd have lunches in a little bistro behind saint Eustache. Uh, it's near where La Halle used to be and nothing's there anymore. I think the church is still there, but not the bistro. And we would draw on the tablecloths. We'd have these four-hour lunches, drinking French wine. And we, we draw on those tablecloths, and I sometimes think, where the hell are those tablecloths now? <laughs> if only I had those tablecloths. He was a wonderful man, George. He did work that's kind of like this. also about the human condition. <laughs> well, George had work like this in his portfolio. He had a coffee down at the back under the office of the magazine, and he went upstairs to Charlie Hebdo. And he was there probably showing the editors his latest cartoons, 
when the murderers burst in. Yeah. They acted out cartoon slogans of devotion to a cartoon version of a cartoon of their god. As they machine gunned the room full of cartoonists. Yeah. Unlike what the Ayatollah said, they weren't martyrs, they weren't valiant, they were criminals. But they, like others, have chilled the air around all satirists, artists, writers, their editors and publishers. All of us are watching our backs now. Here's a drawing of yours from one of my sketchbooks at one of those lunches. I dug it out of uh, storage where I had it. Um, and when he died, I found a quote from him after he died. Uh, and this is uh, what George had written. There is no humor that is Jewish, Arab, black, white, French, or Irish. There aren't 36 different types of humor. There is just humor. Humor like fire, air, water, gold. Always has the same composition. Humorists have only one thought and one idea, which is, I'm nothing and I'm scared. 